the deacon says, let us attend, the priest elevates the holy bread and says aloud, and uh, uh, it's specifically that centerpiece, uh, which is called the amno, that's elevated. So the, there's also the piece, if you guys remember way back when, uh, at the Post Committee, there's the piece for the Thelkos, there's the pieces, piece or pieces for the saints. It's a fragment. Oh, okay, yeah, here we go. So it's this central piece, which is called the lamb amno, taken from the center of the loaf. Um, you'll notice there's two small ones here. Uh, and that's, we usually use separate loaves, but that's because traditionally in parishes, uh, during Lent, you do two three sanctified liturgies, one on Wednesday, one on Friday. And so that centerpiece would be for Sunday and then Wednesday for Friday. Mm -hmm. Who makes uh, that bread? Finley, uh, uh, so yeah, priest. Finley does it most. Finley does it. Oh, it doesn't have to be a priest. It could be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I saw the kids yeah. brought their yeah. son. Yeah, yeah. Because I was watching the kids. This, this yeah. Past, yeah, the kids made it this past Sunday. Oh, and, I can make good. I, I enjoy making it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's a like traditional offering. In fact, we talked about the great interest. They would bring the bread from the, originally they would bring the bread from an outbuilding into the church, and that's where the entrance comes from. Um, but people would just, because they couldn't bring the bread into the altar, they would bring it into this outbuilding. People would, you know, various Christians would come and bring it. Bread offerings and the priest would go pick one and so it's the one that's gonna be so the priest would take place in the outbuilding? No, so so uh uh the it was a, a building called the Schedule Um uh, and you have to think too that uh uh you know as high Constantinople had you know in excess of eight hundred thousand people and so you would you would get tens of thousands of people coming to Hagia Sophia. And in the early church, the tradition was, if you had the means, you would bring bread and or wine. So if you just think about it, uh, you know, the wealthy people would bring five loaves, a bottle of wine, you know, but even the moderate would bring maybe a loaf. So you think of Sunday morning, you know, you'd have thousands and thousands <laughs> of loaves of bread. Um, so we had this separate building that scheduled Philakion, uh, that it would be brought, uh, you know, they'd find the nicest, the best, or the one that, you know, the emperor, empress made, um, and then that would be brought in. And that is what turned into the, the great entrance. But what's interesting is, uh, and you, you can't see it now because it was destroyed when they came to mosque. But there used to be in front of Ayu Sophia, there was this huge open space. And around it, there was this kind of roofed colonnade. Um, and that area of the roof colonnade uh, was where basically the, the indigent could come and rest, get out of it. Um, and those tens of thousands of loaves of bread that wine that wasn't being used for the liturgy would then be distributed for the poor. Um, and to the point that there's actually a saying that, uh, that, that not a single person in the city would go hungry on a Sunday because there was that much bread. But usually they're even, you know, because only the, the poor would take it, that, that even, you know, throughout the week they'd be able to distribute bread. Uh, would that be my room in those days? What's that? Did they do a teeter run in those days? I uh, they they did, but not really the way that we do it now. Um, so on the other uh, here's a seat. Here's a seat. Here's a seat right here. Comes from that that prefix on the means in place of the oh, yeah. gift, and so it was specifically for those who had not communion. Um, and as far as over the centuries that changed a lot you know so there were times and, and actually i think uh in one of the footnotes over here that we're going to look at it's alluded to um there's always kind of been this this kind of eucharistic maximalism that would get a little bit carried away and i think 
this minimal one so it's kind of but they didn't cut up hundreds of loads to get out of hand no 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 and yeah yeah i mean actually it, it was probably an idea sophia probably ended up being hundreds of loads but uh so the bread you know Finley and other people make is the wine still an offering or is that something that yeah so so in in uh there the wine that we use for communion is specifically a sweet wine and it is really supposed to be a sweet wine that has no added sugar, right? So you can have, uh, like, Mavro Dafting, what they'll do is they'll make a wine, but then they'll add uh, essentially, like, the great mustard, great molasses to it, and that's how it gets sweetened. Um, Comandaria, the uh, other wine that we traditionally use, uh, is actually a, a raisin wine. So they'll leave the grapes out, they turn to raisins, which ups the the sugar content of sweet. Um, so because because even even here in the states, most uh, sweet wine is either fortified like a port or sherry, or it has added sugars to it. Most we usually get wine from Greek wine. And it's kind of hard to come by. So uh, more often, every once in a while, people will bring a bottle, but more often or not, they'll they'll like donate some money for the church to buy the wine. <laughs> um, I believe very strongly that. Uh, uh, we should be making our own wine to offer. Could you, with Moscow on wine, be okay? I, if you like, I, 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 I have, I have used it before, <laughs> but I've never, and I actually, there, there's a, there's a place uh, in Harpersville actually that makes it, and I thought that would be really cool. Let's use a, a local so, sweet wine. Like your Alabama Insects. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm an yeah. Alabama Insects. There's a little smooth one, too. Uh, but uh, it's it's sugar. Right, uh, so they, yeah, they add a lot of sugar. What about Mogan Bay? Uh, so we <laughs> we have used, a lot of churches have used Mogan David, many yeah. um, uh, both both cases added sugar. They do have it. Yeah. Yeah. Mogan David? Yeah. What about, uh, Go ahead. Is, what about like things uh but like is it just sugar or is other any type of sweetener? It's like we make should be a hundred percent grape. So yeah, no grape and yeast and okay. fermenting stuff with them. Okay. Some people also are concerned about manchevas because it's kosher as well as Jewish wine. I mean, yeah, for, yeah. different. Why do they need to? It's so, it's so sweet, it's ridiculous. Well, it's, well, that's, what, that's, that's, that's why, that's why, that's why you're tasting it. I thought it was natural. Is it it's not naturally, yeah. not naturally yeah. sweet at all? Yeah. So, so basically, yeah. the way I mean, it probably is. It's a conquered grape. Yeah. Uh, so, it's probably already on the sweeter side. I don't know. The way that wine fermentation works is they use a relatively strong yeast that can handle high levels of alcohol. And it will chew through and turn into alcohol all the sugar that's in the base product. The base product. So you either have to stop the fermentation process, which is while brand there's new. still still sugar left in it, by like heating it or freezing it or doing something else like that, it or adding brand new wines to stop the fermentation. Yes, so that would just raise the alcohol. Yeah, level. but, but that's out of like a yeah. port, right? Which again so is something you shouldn't. Do. That's adding chemicals to change, you know, to change the process. Or you add a softener or sweetener afterwards. You do something to kill off all the yeast in the product, and then you add a sweetener afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like yeah. that's what we're doing. They're doing with the this grape must and the yeah, the, yeah, the, exactly. The but some parishes make their own wine. There, there's a few. There's that's a few. Yeah. yeah. Um, and in Europe, I mean, I think they're still in a lot of yeah, yeah, Europe, yeah. And, yeah. And Greece is still yeah. 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 They went to Albania, they sent her home with like three liter bottles of wine. <laughs> like, they make it and put it in a three liter soda bottle. I, I, I was I, like, I cannot take this on the time. They're like, hey, you can just put taper on the top. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I had a friend who was from Romania, and he would, uh, every time he would go back from Romania, he'd come back and he'd just have like, like liter water jars, and it was filled with this like. Uh, clear plum brandy, oh, yeah. and That's this guy uh, must have been like a hundred and thousand. <laughs> you take a sip, and it would be like someone dropped it in the forehead. <laughs> but uh, I remember he he, he he comes in with the bottle. And he's like, let's have some celebrate. I don't even remember. 
doesn't take a lot to remain sober, right? Um, <laughs> like, yeah, I'm cops. I was like, okay, yeah, yeah. So I get some for like <laughs> coffee, some styrofoam cups, and he's like, oh, no, 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 no. I can't put it in styrofoam because it'll uh, yeah, it'll be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. All right. The holy things that are to be given as as uh the holy things for the holy as an aside that that is a, that is a a better translation to I uh holies the holies plural uh. For the <clears throat> holies, plural, the holy for the things. We've we've kind of uh, added some theological interpretation into it, the holy things for the holy people of God, but really the holy things or the holies for the holies um, is the better translation. The holy things that are to be given as communion to the holy are the holy body and precious blood of Christ. Christ is the only one who is by nature holy, the one and only Lord. We can be called holy only because we are participants in his holiness. The faithful are called holy on account of the Holy One in whom they participate and in whose holy body and blood they commune. The elevation of the holy body of Christ performed by the celebrant at this moment images his lifting up on the cross, his death by crucifixion, and indeed his resurrection. Christ is lifted up in the hands of the priest as upon the cross. The act of lifting up signifies that communion in the Immaculate Mysteries is not permitted to all indiscriminately, for holy things are to be given only to the holy. Holy not meaning here only those who are perfect in virtue, but also those who are struggling to attain that perfection. For there is nothing that prevents them to being sanctified through partaking of the mysteries. The holy are not struggling only to rid themselves of sin, but also to acquire the Holy Spirit. Commenting on the phrase, the holy things for the holy, St. John Chrysostom says, with a loud voice and a terrible cry, the priest raising his hands aloft like a herald standing up high and visible to all the people cries out in a loud voice amidst the total silence, calling some to take communion and barring others, not with his hand, but with his voice. When the priest says the holy things for the holy, he means whoever is not holy, let him not approach. He does not say that only that one should be simply pure of sin, but holy. For the holy person is distinguished not just by being free of sins, but also by the presence of the Holy Spirit and a wealth of good works. He is saying, I do not merely want you to be free of filth, but to be white and beautiful. Whoever is like that, let him approach and touch the royal cups. Any, any questions? Anything? Yeah, that's pretty hot for. Yeah. <laughs> so I was thinking, yeah, you have to, you have to really. Uh, so going back to uh, earlier reading, but also those who are struggling to attain, right? Um, I think with Chris's number, you kind of have to. He has some very, very strong language. Yeah. Um, if uh, you ever get a chance to read his book on the priesthood, <laughs> um, I, I uh, very, very strong. But anyway, I, I always like to balance when he's firm like that with his Paschal homily, where he, he shows this really uh, overabundance of, of compassion. Um, and here he's in the Paschal homily, of course, he's inviting the people to eat uh, at the Lord's table, ultimately. Um, and he says, even those who have not fasted, so even those who are not pure, who have not lived uh, that life, that don't have the virtue to offer. Um, he says, you too come. Uh, and in part because of that, that beautiful line, where it's, he honors the intent. So if the struggle is there, even if we fail, uh, it's that struggle that's that's honored. I think it's interesting with Chrysostom because I mean he's coming at a time where it's right on the heels culturally of the end of the massive persecution of Christians. You know, you're ending a generation of people, Christians, who were dying for their faith by the thousands. So that was just you know this living it completely. So the super high standard, right? Mm -hmm. And Christianity is becoming widespread, common. You know, 
people who barely pay lip service to it or are doing it for political reasons or whatever. So it's a really interesting time. And a lot of what he, he, he sets a lot of really high standards, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know that, um, you know, I, I've heard various people talk about how it's difficult to apply some of those standards today or that, you know, culturally we're so different and what it means to be a Christian and today's culture versus that right. culture is a really Right, and, and there's also, uh, uh, you know, and especially with Christendom and some of these early church fathers, uh, you know, we we read their sermons, we hear their sermons, uh, we quote their sermons, but uh, I, I think our, our understanding of rhetoric is very different. You know, so the, the way that he would speak and he would say these things, uh, uh, you know, we can't necessarily read at face value with our kind of 21st century way of looking at things. Um, you know, so some of the language can seem really, really, really harsh. Um, the interesting thing, uh, last, last, the side, the side on Christendom, the interesting thing about Christendom is, you know, he was not reading from a text. You know, some of these sermons that he would give would be in excess of an hour. But again, you just think of, the amounts of scripture that he's quoting, his his ability to speak, um, and the people people themselves would be writing down what he would say. You know, these scribes would be writing down what he would say, and uh, I haven't seen it anywhere other than Chrysostom. But in some of his homilies, uh, since the scribe is just writing it down, the scribe would actually write down some of his tangents. Um, so he would, you know, there's, there's some homilies where like, you know, he's scolding people for talking in the back. <laughs> uh, there's one famous one where, uh, uh, he goes on this little tangent where at, by the time of Chrysostom, uh, men and women were already sitting separately. Uh, and that, uh, Chrysostom essentially says like, you know, this isn't the way it was supposed to be. We were all supposed to gather together. But you couldn't pay attention, or you're responsible. Uh, so we had to separate you. So he says, "You know, what are we going to have to do next? Do I need to like put up a curtain?" <laughs> you know, so you get this, this idea that like you know people were you know, flirting with each other. <laughs> also, also, uh, back then the people would stand during the sermon and the priest or bishop would sit. <laughs> um, and actually, I'm not positive about, about at the time of Christendom, it might have, I would, nobody would sit, but he may have done it standing. But in the early church, the bishop or the priest would always sit and then the people would, would stand. And that, and that goes, that's, that's true for traditions uh, uh, in the, the ancient temple, the synagogue, as well as yeah, uh, the top. from a seated position. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When when they sit in Moses of Sadie Kai picks up on that. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, so who would who would like uh well oh, oh, first we yeah, Deacon, do you want to read one is holy, one is the One is holy, one is Lord Jesus Christ. To the priest's exclamation, the holy thanks for the holy, the faithful reply, one is holy, one is Lord, Jesus Christ, to the glory of God the Father. The response of the faithful is a confession that through the only begotten Son, who became incarnate and was crucified, we have been sanctified and saved from death and have obtained immortality. For no one possesses sanctity through their own efforts, nor is it a work of human virtue that comes to all from him and because of him. In the same way, if you put many mirrors in the sunlight, each will shine and radiate light, so that one would think there are many suns, while in reality there is but one sun that illumines everything. Similarly, when the Holy One pours himself out into the faithful, he becomes visible in many souls and brings forth many holy people. Yet he alone is the Holy One. The profession, one is holy, made by all people at the end of the mystical rite, reveals the gathering and union beyond all reason and understanding. 
with the mysterious oneness of the divine simplicity of those who have been mystically and wisely made perfect in God, a union that will take place in the incorruptible age of the spiritual world. In that world, those made perfect will behold the light of the invisible and supremely ineffable glory, and together with the heavenly powers will become susceptible to divine purity. Christ is the very source and very root of all good, the very life, the very light, and the very truth. He does not keep his wealth of good things to himself, but pours it out for everyone, and after overflowing, remains full. The very source of holiness transmits to all, angels and humans, the myrrh of holiness. He sanctifies the whole church, and all who keep the receptacle of their soul and body pure receive the fullness of his holiness. I'm going to stop there or just finish the slides. I just finished, yeah. Okay. One is holy, one is Lord, Jesus Christ, the glory of God the Father. Before Christ, no man was able to glorify God fittingly. The Lord alone was able to say to the Father, I have glorified you upon the earth. How did he glorify him? simply by manifesting his own holiness before men, once he had showed himself to be holy as the Father himself is holy. We become partakers of this holiness of Christ when we participate at the Eucharistic table. As the moment of Holy Communion approaches, the Church issues the invitation. If any is holy, let him come. If any is not, let him repent. Maranatha, the Lord is coming. Amen. So I think that this is uh, you know the way that lit liturgy is done now. I don't I don't think it's uh, nearly as apparent as as it once was, especially because um, a lot of the prayers that are said silently are said silently. They were not originally said silently, um, but a lot of the liturgy can be seen in this kind of dialogical way. Um, the the deacon will say something, the people respond right. Uh, the the priest says something that people respond, or the choir chanter responds now. Um, but you would have kind of this, if you really look at it, and if everything was done kind of out loud, you would get this 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 kind of conversation that's going on. Um, and I think it's it's kind of helpful to 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 see it in that way. Uh, and uh, I think this this is this is one of my favorite parts of that dialogue because the priest is saying. He's using the word holy, plural, in two different forms, right? Both in terms of things, but also people. Um, and then the people respond. It's almost like they're they're uh, they're like, whoa, 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 Father, <laughs> slow down there. Isaius, Iski. One is holy. One is Lord Jesus Christ. Um, but of course, and, and it, it, I think it says it beautiful here. Uh, the reason why the things are holy is because it's the very body and blood of the one who's holy. And the eyes, the people are holy because they're the people who participated in that body and blood of the one who is holy. Um, I love that, that image from St. Nicholas of Asilas, as an aside my favorite saint. Uh, the, uh, the image of the, the mirrors with the, the light and this multitude of suns. Um, any, anything stand out in that there? The one is holy one is Lord. Probably, you, you know, we, we we're in the liturgy so often, we hear it so often that I think we just things that that we'd stop to think about, we don't stop to think about because it's just kind of part of our life, which is just the way it should be, which is a good thing. But uh uh the interesting thing about the sin is this is actually one of the few, and if you don't believe me, you can you know read through the liturgy follow along the book, one of the few places. Not just in the liturgy, but in the hymns of the church. You come to Matins and you stay to the end of liturgy, there's only going to be maybe 
depending actually what tone of the week it is, but there'll only probably be a handful of times where you'll see the name Jesus. Just think about it. almost all the hymns you have Christ, you have Savior. Um, and I've heard some people make the argument that uh, in the Greek speaking world, the term Isu and uh, Sophia were seen as synonymous. Um, and uh, Sophia just being the Greek, maybe people are more familiar with it. Um, but it's really interesting. And, and this isn't just applicable for like what happened Sunday mornings, but even if you come to the Holy Week services, uh, throughout all these hymns, Christ, Savior, Lord, Son, uh, Son, Yetupeu, uh, all of these, these terms that are repeated again and again. Uh, and then, you know, that name above all names is kind of mysteriously hidden. Um, Again, this is one of the few hymns in the liturgy, or one of the, even among the prayers, where uh, you have the name. And I think, uh, again, there's, I think scholars tend to lean more towards this idea that uh, Sotia in the early church was seen as synonymous with Isu. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you kind of read between the lines of some of the church fathers, uh, you, you get the sense that that, that name has a, a certain intimacy with it. Because again, if you think about, you know, at least for the last thousand plus years, uh, the main work of most people that would dedicate their life to monasticism really comes down to just repeating that name. You know, everything else apart from services is it's kind of an aside. It's the same the Jesus prayer repeating that name. Um, and so I think there was just kind of this, this intimacy with that name. So it's not that it wasn't valued, but in a sense similar to, uh, uh, I think we all do it. Uh, you know, I think famously the, the rabbis had the tradition of not saying the name of, of God or even spelling it because of, again, this intimacy or sacredness. Um, you know, uh, we have sweet names for our loved ones, you know, the, the uh, we, we use in public, you know, not because we don't value that person and that name's not meaningful, but, uh, you know, it just has the, the intimacy. It's something that I share with this person, not to mention, you know, uh, some of the names, you know, especially couples use with each other. Uh, Kind of cringy if you're not if you're not in, <laughs> in on it. Um, uh, yeah, it's interesting though to say that we don't hear it very often because you see it all the time because it's on every icon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and what does the priest do? We talked about this yeah. last time, yeah. right? And he's yeah. literally blessing you with the yeah. name of Jesus. <laughs> literally, you know, that's what he's doing with his hand. Yeah. It's on the bread. Right. Yeah. They're going to receive the language right on top, you know. So it's like it's written everywhere. We see it Florida. everywhere. Florida. Florida. Yeah. It's just it's all, But it's also it's also kind of almost yeah. like that, that Jewish G D. Yeah. Right? yeah. We have the first letter and the last letter. Mm -hmm. But uh yeah. But again, this is this is it it was very Protestant motion, so. mm -hmm. Christ being so to the saints and his mother and whatnot. This is like, kind of like the apex. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and of course, we use, uh, in our weird English language, we use the, the Latinate, but saint is just the Latin or holy, you know, the Greek, it's Ayus, Ayus, the Ayus, you know, so if, if, again, you know, if someone's uncomfortable coming into church, oh, that person's holy, that person, that person's holy. No, there's one that's holy. <laughs> because that one is holy, they're yeah. also holy. <laughs> um, who would like to read the Lamb of God is waiting? <laughs> The priest strikes the lamb into four parts, saying, The lamb of God is broken and distributed, broken yet not divided, ever eaten yet never consumed, but sanctifying those who partake. 
At the first divine liturgy, he celebrated on earth. Christ broke the bread into pieces and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This action of the Lord of the Lord is repeated at every liturgy and is called the fraction or breaking of the holy body. The celebrant divides the Lamb of God into four parts. He places them on the patent in the form of a cross, and once he himself has received communion, he will then give communion to the faithful. This dividing into pieces of the lamb reveals the slaughter of the honest one. At the crucifixion, the soldiers did not break Christ's legs, as they did with the thieves crucified with him, that the scripture might be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken. In the sacrifice of the liturgy, however, the Lord is broken into pieces and offered to the faithful. St. John Chrysostom underlines, what Christ did not suffer on the cross, he undergoes the offering for your sake. And he endures to be broken so that all may be filled. The fraction is the act that reveals Christ's heart excellence. It was in the breaking of bread that the two disciples recognized him in Emmaus, and the earliest Christians used the term breaking of bread for the Eucharist. Through the breaking of the bread, the undivided Christ is divided up and shared out for our sake, so that we may all be partakers with him. And while being indivisible, he is divided for us, uniting us with himself and making us one as he prayed for in his prayer to God the Father. Um, but just, just a little aside there. If, if, uh, if you go back throughout the gospel accounts, um, there's this, this repeated, and obviously when it, it's discussing the Last Supper, the Mystical Supper. There's this uh, this blessing, breaking, giving to the disciples, uh, but also the miracle of the the loaves and fish. Right? It's that same bless, break, give. Um, and that giving is to the the disciples, who then get with the apostles, who then give to the people. Um, so it's not just uh, specifically at the Lord's Supper that this this language is used, um, as as is mentioned here at the Emmaus. And Emmaus blesses, breaks the bread, and it's in a breaking that he's he's recognized. Do you think the miracles of feeding the multitudes for a little bit? The foreshadowing of the Eucharist, one body broken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the earliest, actually, the earliest uh, uh, kind of liturgical text that we have is something called the Didache of the Twelve Apostles, which is actually uh, as old, if not older, than most of the, the New Testament. Uh, so, very, very early text. Uh, and uh, the the interesting enough, the Anophora prayer uh, doesn't mention directly the supper, the Lord's Supper. It actually talks about how as the uh, loaves were broken and distributed, and then what happens after uh, the people who yeah, eat? The, it's 12 baskets. Well, uh, yeah, they're, they're brought back together. Uh, the priest says, uh, as they were gathered let your people be gathered together into your kingdom. That's awesome. Uh, and it's and it's even more like kind of powerful when you understand that uh, the the church as the new Israel um, and the people, you know, again, twelve tribes. The twelve are now we're now being gathered together into this, this new Israel. Um, and uh, there's 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 even a kind of an interesting. Um, image of, of that judgment of that gathering in all the early churches and we have somewhat of one here there was behind the altar a scene thrown on so the bishop's throne properly was directly behind the holy table and there would be seats or a bench around kind of in that that circle around of the scene thrown on um, and the bishop who is an icon of christ the priests who are icons of the apostles would would kind of image this this uh, this judgment with the table. You read the book of Revelations, what does it show? You have God who's enthroned to his left and his right of the thrones of the uh, apostles, 
the lamb that was slain is brought forward. There's sensing, they're singing ayos, ayos, ayos. Um, it's actually describing the divine liturgy. Would the bishops then face the people? Yes, yes. So, so if you, if you, oh, I have to wait for it. Um, <laughs> so the, yeah, the, this okay. church, every time I look into it. But uh, uh, the, the first liturgies, I mean, obviously the first liturgy was done at a table, right? Um, and so the, if, if we look at some of the early uh, paintings, images that we have, like the catacombs in Rome, uh, that table was actually either uh, a porch view or kind of a, a crescent-shaped table um, with the, the bishop would sit kind of at the pinnacle of that, that horseshoe. Yeah, right. Oh yeah, here, here's a, a beautiful picture of a scene from the no longer mm -hmm. altar, but that, that would be kind of like what it would look like. And there'd usually be a little bit more of a seat in that center. Do um, you have tears? Yeah, so so the, the tears, are, those are just steps that are going up. So they would sit on the bench there, and then there'd be usually a throne that would be kind of attached there in the middle. Uh, but if you think about it, if you have like a horseshoe, the bishop would kind of be at the center, the presbyters would be to his left and his right, and the people would be on the other side of the table. And the deacon was the one who would bring to the people, would bring the prayers, or the bread and wine, the gifts of the people to the priest. The deacon kind of worked and as uh, uh, the one who moved between the, the people and, and the bishop. Uh, Isn't the church in Thessaloniki, that's where the stone hall stood on the face on the scene? Uh, it might be, it might be. It might the be. stone is off to the side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's more like a, uh, today it's just, it's a ground level that it's done. It's just much it's like, yeah. it's exposed, but just like barely, like they tore the floor right there. Okay. Like you can see yeah. it. But um, the church is built on the old synagogue, and so it's nearby but it's like it's not checked, it's really Does that still the like mm -hmm. if Bishop Sebastian were to go to a church that had an actual sentiment, would that be come part of the liturgy or uh, with them or is that more I know some Slavic tradition still there. Um but I I've seen it um uh, when there's like uh but the, the issue now too is the Iconostas has been so built up that even if it's raised, you're not gonna you're not gonna be able to see him. So I remember when uh, Archbishop Demetrius would would serve at the seminary, uh, some of the prayers that we see the bishop do from the front of the altar, like the blessing with the candles, uh, Archbishop would actually do behind the altar um, where the scene throne. I mean, again, in the case of the seminary, it's more of like a... Oh, nice. the, 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 the early Iconostasis were like the one in our chapel or the one in the chapel. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Short yeah, yeah. I mean, and and, and, uh, and that, was, that was... It really wasn't until uh, the triumph of orthodoxy that you even put icons on them. Uh, so not that there wasn't a lot of iconography in churches from... from I mean... Synagogues in the first century Palestine were filled with iconography. Um, everything was iconography back then, or, or images. Um, but uh, really, from the time of uh, the Seventh Ecumenical Council, the Triumph of Orthodoxy, they just got higher and higher and higher and higher. So you get to some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but then again, you know, you have. Uh, Ethiopia that never really had that struggle with iconoclasm. Um, there, some of their churches are like it's not even like there's like a little door and like a wall that's from ceiling to wall with like windows in it. It's very kind of distinct. And they have they've always had icons on theirs. Yeah, yeah. on their console. And I think even some of the earlier ones would have like uh, no, the, there was one I saw in Athens that was in. Some of the ruins that was like had the apple like that, but I think it had 
some sort of carvings or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. So, so, so imagery of some sort was still present. Yeah. So uh, if you guys ever go to uh, the site of the Olympic Games uh, in in Greece, you know, there's there's all these remains of all these like temples, but in the midst of it, there's actually uh, the remains of a church. Uh, and I think I think the church is. Have you been? I think it's like sixth or seventh century, yeah, very very early. Um, and it still has that kind of waist high wall, um, and has like some carved stone crosses. And then, then uh, even when there was that, there would usually be kind of pillars to differentiate the Ode and Kiyoli from the, the beautiful gate from the rest. Uh, I, I haven't found any real evidence of it, but if you kind of think about it, if you have this kind of wall, but there'd always be these kind of two big pillars between you and the altar, right? I think it's kind of a beautiful image. One of, you know, the pillar of smoke and fire that led the people in Exodus out of the land of Egypt. Um, but also, if you've seen any kind of artistic recreations of the Temple of Solomon, there are these two kind of central pillars dominant. We like to take yours on the reading. Christ is he who truly is. That which is partaken of by everyone is not diminished by the participation of the partakers. Let us suppose that there is one source of fire, and from it are lit 10,000 lamps, and twice that number. Does not the fire remain integrally the same despite having passed on its energy to so many lamps? Christ is the source of spiritual fire, which is in no way diminished by being passed on to others but remains complete in itself while forever well employed and imparting good things to all. Christ is broken in pieces, but he is not divided. After the breaking, every part of the holy bread is Christ in his entirety. He is distributed, but remains undivided and whole. He is to be found and recognized in his entirety in each separate part that is cut out. Those who partake Worthily at the sacred table, all receive Christ in his entirety, and he fills us in our entirety. So that those who receive communion can be called and can actually be God's by grace. Thanks to God, who is, who in his entirety has filled them totally and has left no part of them empty of his presence. Christ is wholly present in each of us. He is wholly present in the whole of the church, in all length and breadth of the earth to all ages. From this fullness we have received. We receive the fullness of life and compose the Holy Church, which is his holy body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Material foods are exhaustible by nature, but the Lamb of God is he who has ever eaten, yet never been sickness. The sacrifice is inexhaustible, for it is the never exhausted food of never ending divine life and love. There's a, another, another passage from St. Nicholas Cavazilas that I think very beautifully illustrates this, where he says, uh, with normal food that we eat, uh, our body transforms it into our body, right? Uh, I think St. Nicholas uses this term, the, the higher brings the lower into the higher, right? Um, it says that because the body and blood of Christ that we consume is the body and blood of Christ, that instead of us assimilating it, it assimilates us. And that's also why we can talk about the church as being the body of Christ. Um, St. Paul, in his, his epistles, and, and I, I recommend especially uh, his letters to Corinth, uh, there's almost an ambiguity when he uses the term body of Christ. Is he speaking about the historical born of the Virgin Mary? Is he speaking about the Eucharistic gifts? Is he speaking about those who are gathered around the table? And I think the answer is all, right? That they're synonymous, you know, um, by, by the, the Holy Spirit. So in a sense, it consumes us as opposed to us consuming.
consciousness. Uh, Deacon, Master, fill the holy cup. Again, this is, you know, it's, it's, uh, you guys are used to it here, but it's really uncommon, especially in this country, to have a deacon to do services. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, as a, as a priest, not only is, is, is it more difficult to actually do the liturgy because a lot of those, those prayers have to be rushed. Um, as we're doing the parts that typically the deacon would do, but uh, you either end up kind of losing part of this this dialogue or this trilogue, right? Uh, I don't know if that's a real word, <laughs> but it should be. Um, yeah. Part of this trilogue where you, you end up like feeling crazy and talking to yourself. Father bless. bless. <laughs> so it, it's, it's just, it, uh, and again, I, I am of the, the feeling that, that everything should be done aloud because that's the way it was originally. Um, but, uh, but anyways. Is he whisper, is, he whisper this? Yeah, could you yeah, couldn't possibly say all those words um, every time we go from one thing to the other. Was that? That's a word. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so this part, I don't whisper it necessarily, but I do just have my mic off. I'm just talking. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a private dialogue. In fact, all throughout the service, I'm kind of constantly talking. Right, right, right. Like that, you know, before I go out, I ask for their blessing. You know, before and and so there's just kind of constantly this this interchange between the priests and the deacon. And just like when I come out, there's constantly the interchange between the deacon and the deacon. Um, Why is it that we don't have more deacons in America? Do most of them? We're not first? useful. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, utilitarian is probably better. We're useful. So, so the, uh, I mean, it, this it, the, the reality is uh, that uh, a parish priests like our our. Now there's there's pastoral there's all these things, but the essentials are your babies need baptized, liturgy needs to happen on Sundays, people need to get married, people need to get buried, all of those kind of uh, all of those things a priest can do a deacon can't do. Uh, I mean a deacon can actually lay people can do baptisms in, in times of emergency but really to do a liturgy you need a priest uh, and so if if someone has kind of historically kind of gone their out of a seminary and stuff you know even if they want to remain a deacon you know the bishop's usually like oh that three parishes <laughs> uh, you know so they, they kind of kind of rushed along um, and even even in larger communities um, you know, the, you know, sometimes the Boba priest wants to you know, go up to Pennsylvania to visit his family. So there's another priest they can they can fill in the lights. Marcus Kelly was telling me that up until recently, priests were not taught how to use it again. So. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, there were always were deacons at seminary just because, uh, but I obviously wasn't a, a priest back then. Um, so, yeah, most, most, I mean, I'm sure you have experience, well, even, even when, when Father Gregory's gone and I'm serving with Deacon Tikhon, because when I'm usually the protos, the main celebrant, you know, it's during weekday services when Deacon Tikhon's not here. And so that it's not uncommon for, for me to like steal one of his lines or, <laughs> or, or something, but, uh. Now, are there more deacons and priests and suffers that kind of the same track? Um, I, I think not, not that they're, I, I think even in Greece, most of the deacons do end up becoming priests. Uh, but most part, most, most of the time, I think they have a longer diaconate. It's more of a, a year sometimes, um, until they make priests. I think I was a, I was a deacon for two weeks, I think. So. Oh, yeah. There's been a pull towards the middle of the act. You know, like Father was saying earlier, initially the bishop did the service and the priests were sitting there beside him, and they would, you know, and there was a really important role for the bishop liturgically, like in all the Eucharistic services. And the deacon had a role, 
And then there's this kind of pull towards from both sides, honestly, some of the stuff that the pre the bishop exclusively did, and some of the stuff that the deacon exclusively did kind of got pulled into the priesthood, which grew over time. Yeah. Because it's more utilitarian yeah. to have these priests in all these places that can do all that stuff by themselves without because the deacon, you know, I can't like I said, I can't even go out and do a litany without asking the priest to give me a blessing. Uh, even within the service, you know, I can't be invested without asking the priest to give me a blessing. And 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 uh, and historically, that was true of the priest too. And so, like even even, uh, uh, but if the bishop is present, like I can't do anything without getting the the bishop's blessing. Um, but yeah, historically, the presbyter, the priest, had a very very narrow role, which was was one uh, advising. Like you know, this idea of the presbytery literally meant elders, the elders that advised the bishop. But the the presbyter's main role was was the preaching and teaching. Um, so you you can almost say that the 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 bishop was largely concerned with the sacraments. So if you think about like uh, the liturgies, who are they named after? Chrysostom, Saint Basil. Um, the bishop would be responsible for the Dhamma the, the, the liturgy itself. Um, but even most of the homilies that we have of St. John Chrysostom actually come from when he was a presbyter uh, as opposed to a bishop. Um, now, by his time, the bishops were doing more of that, that public preaching, but it was usually the presbyters that would preach and teach, um, the bishops that would handle you know, the sacraments, and the deacons would. Uh, Actually, do the work. <laughs> yes, yeah, you know, it's been has it had the same role from the very beginning. Like, like no, what, what, yeah, yeah, so, in the same sense. So there, there's, I mean, throughout the history of the church and in different, especially early in the church, you know, for those first eight hundred years, uh, there, there's a big diversity. Um, so, so like, there were places very early on. I mean, there were, there were actually places where. Uh, Presbyter and Episcopos were, were synonymous. Right? Um, the first ones were meals. Yeah, the, the deacons had a uh, concern to take care of it. There's that passage where the, the apostles needed to preach and teach. So they ordained so aside the deacons to take care of the orphans and widows. Um, so that, that kind of practical side. Uh, but what did they kill St. Stephen? What's that? What was, was St. Stephen doing when they killed him? Yeah, yeah, so, so yeah, it's a it's an interesting but your uh, question. Yeah. Holy Cross now has a program called the Permanent Director, yeah, no, men who want now it's called the special program for special needs. Special, special needs. Needs. Oh, <laughs> they decided they couldn't call it permanent, they keep trying to say that basically it's from men who wish. You don't aspire to the priesthood. You're trying to make up the church. What is this? All right. Well, thank thank you guys. Uh, it's a good thing that I don't usually do this. We're still being in the book. Bye, everybody.